Hi everyone. Could I just start with um, Eki's comment about grasping at links? I don't think we actually needed to grasp too much of the links tonight. It was actually fantastic to hear Greg and then Eki and then Byron, their takes on different aspects of things. Could I start though with a question back to, to Greg from your start? Your notion of the fundamentals of, of sound and hearing and the biological links and all of those things, the notion of approaching music from firstly from touch to the other aspects, how do we link that now to going to a performance at Chambermaid Opera as a complete, you know, foreigner, a complete yep, yep. new child? Thank you for asking me. Um, okay, as you remember, like, well, hopefully, I got across towards the end thinking about music in terms of predictability and, and uh, probability, right? So music really, to me, the way I understand it, and, and art generally, really, is setting up um, systems of prediction, okay? So we're hearing in music, we're hearing, say, I mean, talk, let's talk, I'm going to start traditionally, then I'm going to move to say something that we just heard a few minutes ago, right? So what we've got is we've got sort of phrasal length structures that are repeating, we've got little tiny rhythmic structures, we've got harmonic relationships, we've got all sorts of relationships that are repeating. And you can think of those as repeating, as, as setting up um, patterns of predictability at a range of scales. There's things that are repeating every minute, there's things that are repeating across 20 minute intervals, there's things that are repeating every couple of seconds, whatever. I think what's happened with, say, contemporary music, thinking about say, what we were just hearing uh, earlier, the way, and also I think in visual art as well, is people have started playing with the notion of, of multi-scale prediction systems which are more abstract. And so they relate more to our day-to-day -day experience without the intervention of, of, um, of some cultural history. Okay, so when I listen to something like I was listening to a few minutes ago, I'm hearing, um, if I want to break it down in terms of patterns of predictability, I'm hearing there's some stuff happening with a certain sort of statistical regularity in, in with this instrument or with this type of um, attack, you know, or whatever, and other things happening with a difference at another scale of prediction. What I think is happening in the brain is that when we hear something like that, our brain is functioning to, um, is activating to those scales of prediction. And in our history, those sorts of things have happened in our environment and they've been attached to, while they're happening, they've been attached to some sort of emotional uh, valence, some sort of strength of emotion, right? Some sort of emotion, just through our normal life. So as we've grown up and we've lived, our sensory systems are taking in these patterns from the environment. So here I'm talking really hardcore materialism. They're taking in patterns, sensory systems taking in patterns of stimulation from the environment at a range of scales. Those patterns of stimulation have emotions attached to them. We remember, virtually everything we have influences the dynamics of our system that goes on. We build on our history. And then when we're hearing or looking at artworks, what's happening is that we're stimulating the brain. And you might think of it as like a resonance. There's a resonance of those scales of prediction and that also triggers off the emotions that are attached to those. Could we just pause there? <laughs> Thank you. But part of, part of the discussion between the three of you, or the comments you made, the word filter kept coming through, mm -hmm. whether it be the filter of the womb, the filter of, of the sound, the filter of the spatialisation. That filter... Is it a blocker to our understanding of the music or is it actually an, in a, an enabler? I, I don't see it as something blocking things. I think filtering is... Uh, it's like when you think of constraints on systems. Okay, I'm just going to move that slightly. Think of a filter as like a constraint on the system. Like we've constrained the system, we can only access some aspect of it, right? And you have a couple of different sorts of constraints in my view. And I should jump over to other people. Um, you, have a, you have a couple of uh, constraints, systems of constraints. Some constraints stop you from doing things, yeah. they're a block. But other constraints are enabling. And I think a, a, an analogy I'd use would be, say, um, the way engines work, right? So pistons in an engine are constrained to a certain action. And if they weren't, they wouldn't work. Byron, the enablers to the performance, or the the, the blockers? Yeah. Oh, look, I think that um, 
in many ways, like with the spatialization in another other, and in terms of that sense of enabling or blocking, I mean, I, um, in many ways, I feel like that with my job as the sound designer, it's like I'm trying to, in many ways, design that filter, like to design that system of how much enabling or how much blocking the artists themselves require in terms of the communication of their ideas. And so that can happen on a very kind of very much practical level of like actually helping them to literally plug the system together and actually kind of to, to, to the very much the function of sort of like, you know, assembling and building the machine. But then also that can only come from like some more from larger design considerations and thinking about what the artistic intention is and then how we can kind of build a system that will give them the most amount of flexibility for their ideas to come through. But then also there's always like another layer of practical concern in terms of just budgeting and what can be afforded because of course like you know tools itself, yeah tools it? yeah tools are a filter and you know like i mean in terms of pure audio when we talk about filters like filters are a primary tool for manipulating sound in any electronic system they're in fact the, probably one of the most earliest developed tools in like even in, tel in the telephonic system the very early development of it like filtration is a kind of huge part of that as an electronic device but from beyond that with the idea of, of, of filtering ideas more generally, I would say that, yeah, the design, the design of the system is very much trying to operate in this way to be this variable filter that when the artists uh, inject their intention and their ideas into that, that it's able to have enough flexibility and capability to communicate those ideas given whatever other practical constraints Thank exist. Thank you. And from the artist's perspective? Um, well, I guess I think about, I mean, I think about physical filtering of sound as a composer, mm -hmm. but I guess as a uh, phenomenologically, I think about it in terms of the experience in any space. Uh, and I think that's where, I, I guess, um, I mean, two, thing, two things spring to mind. One is that, that, that we all filter background noise or certain aspects, both visually and, and, and orally and pretty touch-wise as well. Um, in order to concentrate on the important things that that we're trying to understand about the, the environment, important. yeah, yeah, what we what we see as important. So you pretty think that my voice, being a human voice, is more important than the the background noise of the the air conditioning, you know, which is quite present if mm. if I stop talking. But as soon as I stop talking, you probably don't even notice it. And I think that's we kind of played with. Um, we, we call them masks in, in, in another other, but really they are kind of like filters. And, and for us, it's again one of these metaphors that Byron was talking about. And for us, that was a physical way to create these textures that we would introduce into the space that when you first hear them, you would, they would get your attention and they would be like the main musical material in, in the space. But very soon you would kind of they would become the background and and they would be a kind of a veil through which you're trying to make out the shapes behind so so we were trying to create this kind of in a very in, in a sonic way that 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 there would be this kind of let's imagine that the air conditioning or you know let's imagine you're on a plane and and the 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 engines are so loud that you have to shout or you have to really strain to hear um what the human voice in that in that texture. So, you know, we played a lot with those kinds of things. And I suppose then, you know, another kind of divergent point that, that I thought about when Greg talked about this idea of, of um, uh, repetition and, and, you know, we want to hear, uh, we want to, to sense repeated structures so that which which structure our, our you know sensory uh, perception of the world and and that's that's a that's a really interesting thing for an artist to think about especially a musician if you're trying to create suspense or surprise uh, you know you, if you if you use one gesture once it might be surprising but straight away when you use it the next time it becomes a completely different element so, so we also played with that in another other, uh, in that we do things that we we try to be like very surprising sonic moments, but then they would happen again and again until the repetition itself became 
something different. Mm. And, you know, there's lots of philosophers talk about this. You know, Deleuze talks about it no end, um, about repetition and difference and how we, how we construct them. Um, all the, you know, students in the room are pretty sick of Deleuze. <laughs> Um, never, never. We'll stop you there. Yeah. yeah. Question before we get it too much further into Deleuze. Thank you. <laughs> Questions or comments, please. <laughs> please. Uh, almost a question or observation about this idea of uh, talking to or talking around a situation. So, just making a segue between the two presentations. Children, you sometimes talk at them directly or you talk around them so they at least get observed what you're talking about and similar within work situations where uh, the conversation is somewhat absorbed not actually being directed to someone so I was just wondering Byron with your kind of breaking down of that that cinematic <coughs> presentation is, is very much we're telling you what the sound is and what you're going to experience whereas that kind of more abstracted one is about putting the sound around so it's talking around it and visually I noticed in the production that there were some moments where it was all about the thing on the screen mm. and you were being told this is what it's about. Mm. You're being told that but you're hearing something else. Mm. So you're actually playing with that kind of talking to literally but then expanding it out. So I was just wondering how, uh, how the, the, the panel might want to talk about that sort of concept of, of when, when you have moments where you actually want to bring attention to, you know, this is what? a performance, this isn't... This isn't recorded, this is a thing that's happening now, as opposed to this whole thing is an environment that's just kind of rolling along. I, I, I think that um, uh, probably uh, uh, when that sort of hearing you talk about that just reminded me a lot of like um, Michelle Sheon and his writing about s sound and screen and about how the illusion of the screen when it's presented in front of us allows us, allows people as sound artists a certain amount of conceit or room to move that in fact there are things that we can get away with sonically once we have a screen in front of us that we can't get away with sometimes in other contexts and that very much in many ways that another other that's another kind of layer to like how the piece actually works with the fact that the screens are so present that in fact you view the performers through the veil of the screen and that from both sides of the audience you have three layers of screen like there's the layer that's most in front of you the layer on the other side of the performers and then the most distant layer off Far again, and this idea of um, separate, like both the spatial aspect of that, but then the psychological kind of like, I guess, impact or um, potential of, of of doing those kind of things. But um, we actually, you know, just to yeah, quickly no, 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 interject, go, go, go. the another one of these grand metaphors for our work was that because in the film Elizabeth's mute, the visuals in another other kind of represent Elizabeth. So we kind of choreographed a lot of the visuals to to go with the with the choreography of Elizabeth's um, screen presence, and then the sound represented Alma, you know, in a loose way. So so you know that was kind of the dramaturgy that that there was, and and the fact that the the sound in the film, you know, Alma can't get through to Elizabeth, or Elizabeth won't respond. We tried to kind of find an analogy of that in the sense that. The visuals just refuse to to respond to the sounds, mm. or that there 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 was this kind of uh, refusal for the two to communicate, or coalesce into a meaningful whole. So again, you know, this is the ceiling thing where you know we kind of we kind of let the two balls just keep passing each other yeah, yeah, without yeah. without yeah. you know without yeah. that bouncing back, yeah. yep. and and then you know at, at critical moments like in the film, the two possibly kind of communicate. We kind of had these critical moments in, in another mm. other two mm -hmm. where, but possibly by then the audience was so kind of bewildered that, that mm. they'd already made up their own kind of connection mm. between the visual and the sound <laughs> yeah. or, they, or they possibly missed those and, things. And I think that's an interesting part to talk about. The spatialization aspect of the sound allows for a certain amount of ab abstraction, like a certain amount of spontaneous, spontaneous acoustic effects to occur. Mm. And I think with what Eki's talking about, the same thing happens with our kind of rendering of like, is this sound connected to this image or not? Like, because of course we're very enculturated in how we view screens, how sound and screen work together as a single whole in our mind. And so then in many ways, 
with what Aki is talking about there, that there's a certain amount of um, space for the audience themselves to occupy in terms of how they interpret what's actually occurring and whether there's meaning there or not on, and what's actually occurring. And that, you know, different audience members, and I'm sure Aki could talk to this it's in some ways, that everyone, of course, comes out of a performance like another other with very differing perspectives on like what the actual piece was or what it meant to them and that this layering and this kind of very sort of non-defined space and in fact is it talking to you or is it talking around you kind of really I guess in many ways came back to the individuals and like whatever they bring into the room with them and then whatever meaning they derive like I guess out of out of what they experience. So that. Greg, was the performance talking at you or <laughs> with you? Oh, in, in some yeah. moments, yeah, yeah. But I was just trying to think about like digital, in the digital space or in the, that concept of reproduction, you're inherently about, we're, we're confronted with things that talk to you all the time. Yeah. So how do you enable people to actually let something just be around them? Which is what, you know, podcasts are kind of around more even though they're kind of quite direct, but in the way in which people are accessing content these days, it's a more kind of around you approach to media as opposed to you gotta watch the screen and listen at the same time. So I was I was trying to I guess thinking about that. But yeah, the personal experience was very much both forms. And that's like, Byron's point about every audience member mm-hmm. is gonna have that 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 experience. I, that. I feel like that's something that's sort of if we if we if the work becomes more narrative and prescriptive you know we feel like we're being led down a certain yep. path and then as it becomes more abstract we, that field opens up a lot wider and then you know in many ways too i think that i don't know like certain forms of narrative now are like are quite we're like culturally like maybe we're a bit worn on certain certain aspects of that that like in many mm-hmm. ways you know if we want to like i think it's interesting to note that like with dramatic sort of narrative that now we want to watch 7 hours worth of game of thrones uh, 90, min- 90 minutes 90 minutes of a feature film doesn't cut it anymore yeah. in terms of like that the, the, that we need we require we require more depth or more nuance like in some ways you know uh, I guess you know I- at least in terms of screen culture like it feels very much like that at the moment I think that's right and I think that thing with TV uh, versus film is again about um, the interaction of story arcs right you know so you're watching I mean I always used to think about um, like watching Star Trek on TV you know and the show's going along and then it hits it's a really interesting premise and they build it up and then it's like they go shit we've got to finish in five minutes and they resolve it right yeah. every show is like that yeah. and so and movies almost are like yeah. that now you've got this uh, it's going to resolve itself yeah. I want to see something take seven hours to resolve I want to see these interlocking Bella Tar films <laughs> <laughs> we might just hold that one yeah. other questions please other comments, thanks. Uh, interested in the evolutionary perspective of, mm-hmm. um, I suppose, finding the most common denominator in terms of sounds. Um, is there any, I don't know whether they've got a question, but the cultural aspects of that, I suppose, across cultures and across time, can you comment on how that has worked or your, your thoughts on? I'm not sure. I'm getting where you're coming from, but in terms oh, about of musicians and and, All right, okay. and music, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, finding a form that is happens to be popular. Okay, it seems to me so. Any any. Okay, so apparently it's not like I know all cultures across all time, but everyone always talks about, um, you know, all cultures across all time have had some sort of music dance sort of interac- interaction, right? So we're just going to assume. It's ubiquitous and it's universal. So it's this basic human activity. Um, If you get a bunch of people doing things, doing some music together, of necessity, someone is going to be the sort of central actor to whom everyone else is most like. That's just a stats thing. It's got nothing to do with whether they want to be like that or anything. Everyone could be trying to be the most different they can be from each other, but someone's going to be most like everybody else, right? So that's my thing about, say, the attribution of leadership to that sort of person. So that will relate, that, that's irrespective of any culture, anything, someone's going to be doing that sort of thing. So, so from that point of view, if you relate that to either um, gaining power within a group, which may lead to more um, sexual partners, may lead to more resource allocation, doesn't really matter, you know, right? It's going to propagate your genetic material better. 
that's how I see all that sort of stuff happening. It doesn't really matter what sort of music or what sort of group that's doing. It's as soon as you get you know, a few people together, that's going to happen. So you can still be like a griot musician who's a low-class person, but amongst your group you might be high-class. Right? It doesn't mean that you're going to be you know, president of the US or something. It just means amongst your group, your potential sexual partners or your potential mates or whatever it is, you're going to become someone of value, of higher value, because you provide this sort of central synchronous uh, predictability to the group. Is, is that what you get now? Um, yeah, except on a bigger level, on a global level, I suppose. Well, I mean, so the thing is, it applies, it applies, it applies, it applies at all scales. It applies <laughs> yeah. at all scales. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. So, I'm really conscious we're well over time, but there must be another question. Well, I've got two very quick questions. First one was, is your paper available for us to read in full? Will it be somewhere? I'm sure it will be, yes. yes. It's in your inbox. It's, it's in your inbox. Oh. Oh, I get a lot of spam in my inbox. Sorry about yeah, that, I missed it. I do yeah, so the, the, stuff I'm, the stuff that I've done on um, adaptive stuff, which is stuff I did about a decade ago, and I'd sort of forgotten about really because I didn't have any sort of venue for it, and I was looking at it the other day and I thought, oh, this is all right, maybe I'll publish this. <laughs> so, so that stuff hasn't been, and there's like you know, thousands of words on that. I mean, but the, a bunch of other stuff, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to make that available. Yeah, yeah. thank you. We can, and I had the other very small question was in terms of the baby talk rhythms that you were talking about and that that is universal to all cultures. Are the so, rhythms the same no, in different in languages? Fact, no, in fact, what's really interesting is there's indications that the rhythmical material in the language, in your na native language, and again, this um, would apply to more abstract level to contemporary composers, and no one's done the work on it, but I bet it still applies, uh, influences the melodic and, and rhythmic material produced by composers in that language group. Yeah, absolutely. There's a whole bunch of stuff done on that too. So yeah, it, it, it really just flows through, you know, right from when you're that big. <laughs> Before you're even that big. Yeah, yeah, exactly. One final question. I've got a question uh, about the, the repeated rhythms yeah, yeah. in relation to art music. Yeah. And the fact that in a lot of art music, as we were talking, there aren't those repeated yeah, rhythms. Yeah. And whether you think or whether people think that the, the appreciation of that by a person is if there's something about being repressing your basic, your, your childlike, your natural inclination to want to dance and therefore feeling sort of sophisticated because of that. I don't or know. Is it filtering it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you can talk that. I mean, I can't see any problem between someone liking really abstract sort of contemporary music and liking to dance. But uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm personally a fan of lots of groovy music, and <laughs> yeah, you know, oh, I don't mean that. I don't mean that. The, well, you have I to mean, like one what, 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 what I'm, and what I'm saying is that I'm, I don't, I don't draw a hierarchical difference between listening to bluegrass or listening to disco or listening to um, disco. you know, Pamegiani, for, for instance. Um, I just, I personally, I can only speak from my personal kind of perspective, I'm interested in uh, sound as a phenomenon in different ways rather than just as a, I guess, culturally past uh, activity, which is, you know, which can be very many things, but by which I guess this idea of, of groove-based music, for instance, is, is a very typical example of. Um, and I... You know, there are plenty of people like me in the world who, who find other aspects of sound interesting. Hmm. And I suppose that, that in itself has become another kind of uh, culture that's passed on through generations. I mean, there's, hmm. there's generations of, of musicians and composers and performers and listeners who are interested in, in sounds that aren't purely uh, repetitious. You know, and, and, and that in itself is a, is a, can, can include meditation music or, you know, ideas about beta waves and alpha waves, you know, like basing music on, on things like that, or, or really abstract kind of uh, digitally produced and very uh, kind of uh, seemingly rarefied um, kind of music, which, which, you know, to me, they're just different different ways to manipulate sound and and, it, and there's all, always you know music 
is called organized sound because there's always some kind of organizational principle that you, even if it's randomness, I mean, randomness is an organizational principle. Mm. And that has, been, that has been formalized by different composers mm. as well as a, as a, as a uh, very specific kind of concept. And I think it, it, just because we can't hear the structure, which, you know, in a, in a groove-based music, it can be heard quite simply in terms of the rhythmic regularity and uh, the, the verses and the choruses or, or, you know, or, you know, solos and heads in jazz, or etc. There's still some, you know, all music will have some kind of organising principle. And, and then it's just whether you're receptive to that kind of aesthetic uh, aesthetic experience or not, and I, you know, I don't. Uh, there aren't plenty of classical composers who make a hierarchical difference. There's no doubt about it. But I think more and more, certainly, uh, the kind of the people I respect in in contemporary music who make music that's very abstract, they don't make those distinctions at all. Um, mm. And I think that's 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 a really healthy environment. Um, for myself, exactly. that's fantastic. Yep. With that, we will finish. Eki, Byron and Greg, thank you. I'm sure there's going to be more questions to come, but we'll, we'll finish this part now.